Okay, so according to my watch, it's 1230 here in Chicago. So that means it's either good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending upon where everybody is. Um, I'm David Hughes, and I'm joined by Samantha Breslow. And this is the first installment of the HMB Work From Home webinar series. So we're, we're really glad that everybody could join us. I know this is a difficult time. It's a very stressful time for people. You're sheltering at home, your schedules and routines have been thrown off. And so we thought it might be a nice idea to provide a little salt content for everybody while they're at home. And I don't know if this is refreshing, but this will not be COVID related salt content. Uh, we're gonna go in a, in a little bit different direction. Uh, we also hope that everybody is, is safe and healthy. Again, this is a stressful time and we're, we're glad that everybody could join us uh, today. So a couple of preliminary housekeeping matters uh, before we dive into the content. Um, first, as far as content goes, this is on the Internet Tax Freedom Act, which we'll, we'll get into in detail. Uh, but as far as housekeeping goes, a few things. First, if um, you want CPE credit, and, and we are making CPE credit available, but if you need the credit, we ask that you stay with us for the entire 60 minutes. Uh, we will have some polling questions throughout uh, that you can participate in uh, to confirm that you're, uh, that you're on the, the webinar. Um, we also have a survey at the end, um, which if you don't mind, we would really appreciate if you complete it. That will help us plan future seminars um, or webinars. Um, and we do have a few more in this series, which we'll discuss briefly at the end of this webinar. And then finally, if you have questions, um, please don't be afraid to ask. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to monitor those throughout the webinar. And we will try to answer them in real time. Um, if we don't get to them in real time, uh, we will do our best to follow up with you offline and try to answer the questions then. So as far as today's webinar goes, Sam, if you want to jump to the, uh, to the agenda slide. So this is what we're going to cover um, under the Internet Tax Freedom Act. Sam is going to talk about uh, the adoption and the intent of the Internet Tax Freedom Act. And, and then we'll talk about some court cases. Um, some of the cases have been taxpayer victories. Some have been losses. Some of the cases we're going to talk about didn't even raise the Internet Tax Freedom Act, but we think they're worth, uh, worth discussing. And then finally, we'll, we'll pull out our crystal balls and, and try to predict exactly where we're going with the Internet Tax Freedom Act. Um, a couple of preliminary comments on the ITFA uh, before we, we get into the meats and potatoes. The first is don't make the same mistake that I made many years ago when I confused IFTA with ITFA. So we are talking about the Internet Tax Freedom Act, ITFA, which is not to be confused with IFTA, the International Fuel Tax Agreement. I had somebody reach out to me many years ago, and this was right around the time that ITFA was adopted by Congress, and this person asked me what I knew about IFTA. And I said, oh, I said, it's been in all the tax press. I've been reading all about it. So this person then proceeded to spend 15 minutes talking to me about a motor fuel tax audit. Um, I was very confused at the end of the discussion. And um, so for those of you who are, are waiting to um, or hoping to hear about motor fuel taxes, um, you're in the, uh, in the wrong place. The other thing about IFTA is, is, you know, it, it makes me think of the expression, the internet of things. It's an expression many of us have heard, and it, it really has to do with how the internet connects everybody and about how it's possible to do so many things these days on the internet, whether it's shop, whether it's play games, download music, store music, advertise, watch movies, television shows, etc. And, and with all these things that we can do now on the internet, we have new businesses and new business models. So we have Netflix and we have Spotify and Apple Music. And with new business models, 
come new revenue streams. And with new revenue streams come new opportunities for state departments of revenue to find um, new sources of tax. And, and that's where the Internet Tax Freedom Act comes in. And it's over 20 years old, and it is very much a bar or a prohibition on a state's ability to collect tax in certain situations. And, and as you'll see as we move through these materials, it has been used, and in at least one situation, used successfully. But I, I, I don't know if it's something that is necessarily on the top of people's minds, that I don't know if people think, taxpayers think, tax representatives think, when they're faced with a situation, oh, does this violate the Internet Tax Freedom Act? Well, with so many businesses and so many business models moving to the internet, I, I think it is something we need to start thinking about because I think there's a lot more violations or potential violations that are out there than maybe we realize. So with that as an introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Sam and let her tell us a little bit about the adoption and intent of ITFA. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, we appreciate you joining our webinar this afternoon. In case you are not familiar with the Zoom formats, you can change your view. I think Dave might have mentioned this at the top to see different, if you just wanna see whoever the speaker is, you can change it to the speaker view. Or if you don't wanna see us at all, you just wanna see the slides, you can do that up at the top, just wanna to make you aware. But yeah, thank you for that introduction, Dave. So before we can get into the significant case law and, and why IDFA is a really good resource in the context of audit or in cases when you're in litigation, we need to go through and explore the adoption and the intent behind it. What was the intent behind Clinton's administration when they initially adopted IDFA back in 1998? So it started off as a three-year moratorium on taxes on internet access and also taxes on uh, either uh, multiple taxes or discriminatory taxes, which we'll explore uh, what those two things are in this context. It was extended multiple, multiple times. So again, it just started off as a moratorium, which is temporary, but was extended by several years to 2001, then again to 2004, What's notable about the 2004 extension is at that time, several uh, different DSL or digital subscribers had implemented, there'd been taxes implemented on DSL or internet connections, um, claiming that that fell outside of the new taxes on internet access. So what they did at that point was they changed the definition of internet access to include DSL. Um, and then previous taxes that had already been imposed on DSL or VoIP were extended grandfather protection. Um, so there are states that already had taxes on internet access previously that were provided grandfather protection at the beginning. And those grandfather clauses have extended throughout all of these extensions, um, ultimately until this final, where they are set to expire on June 30th of this year. Um, so that is coming up. But the bottom line is uh, the original moratorium was extended again to 2014, 2015, and finally in 2016 through public law 114, 125. And, and that's currently the law that in place, which is a permanent prohibition on again, new taxes on internet access or multiple or discriminatory taxes on electronic commerce. I want to talk about the grandfather clauses a little bit because I think they're interesting, especially with them coming to an end in June. So there are currently six states that have grandfather clauses, Texas, Hawaii, New Mexico, San Diego, Ohio, uh, Wisconsin. Those six states uh, each have currently a grandfather clause still in place, which allows them to continue to impose taxes on Internet access um, because they had it in place at the time. They estimate that over a billion dollars in lost revenue is going to occur uh, when those grandfather clauses are no longer in place, meaning that they can no longer tax internet access. In some states, it's gonna have a bigger impact than others. In Texas, they're estimating over 500 million lost revenue when they can no longer tax internet access. In Hawaii, it's less, it's only a million. Um, but it's interesting with the interplay of Wayfair because Wayfair has 
generated quite a bit of revenue for states. They estimate that in Texas, where they have, are going to have that $500 million loss from taxes on internet access, they're going to make up. It's just a wash because they, they're, gonna, they're estimating $200 million in uh, revenue from remote sellers and $300 million from marketplace facilitator loss. So in some states, it might just even out, um, and it won't actually have this huge impact on state budgets as maybe they originally intended back in 1998. I think the timing with COVID is also really interesting with these grandfather clauses, because if we look to the intent of ITFA, what was the intent? It was to protect the internet, this infant, this fledgling service back in 1998. Um, Clinton's administration was concerned with just the nature of it. It's indifferent to state lines. Uh, they were concerned that multiple states would impose taxes either on internet access or again on uh, multiple uh, taxes on electronic commerce. So in order to prevent that, they imposed this act or adopted this act. Um, so it is the unique nature of the internet that they thought made it so susceptible. If, if one of the goals of ITFA was to increase access to the internet to make sure that low income consumers have access to the internet. Well, it's great timing uh, with COVID, not that, you know, the, the fact that these grandfather classes are gonna come to an end because you have a lot of individuals who are out there having to homeschool their students right now. Um, personally, my mom's an administrator in a school in Texas and they're having to deliver the materials by hand to students in order to, uh, in order to have access at home because they don't have access to the internet and can't download the materials. So the fact is, in these six states, uh, when these grandfather clauses come to an end, it should theoretically improve low-income consumers' access to the internet. The question is, is that really the case? Uh, the studies are sort of all over on the board on this. I've seen studies that have shown that um, only 6% of people who don't have access to the internet say it's because of cost. I've seen as high as 19%. Uh, really, realistically, if cost is a prohibitive factor for the internet, what's probably more likely to happen is that you just won't pay for the high speed internet. You'll pay for some, you know, less expensive access. Um, so maybe what ITFO was trying to achieve isn't actually working here if the goal was to increase access to the internet. It's also a blanket subsidy, meaning that it's, it's going to apply, this exemption applies regardless of wealth. Uh, making it regressive. So setting out that framework for the adoption and the intent of ITFA, I think is really important when we analyze in the context of these cases, whether they are in fact discriminatory or uh, whether internet access um, is being taxed. So parsing through the actual act and the terminology, um, we, I want to walk you through some of these definitions because the case law does get into um, the specifics of the language and sort of parses it out. So uh, again, a state or a local subdivision can't impose uh, in either of the following. Taxes on internet access, which is defined as a service that enables users to access content, information, electronic mail, or other services offered over the internet. It may also include access to proprietary content, information, and other services as part of a package of services offered to consumers. So Dave and I were talking about this the other day. I mean, it may seem easy to understand what internet access is, but when you actually get into the context of it, it may not be so easy. We talked about the fact that they added uh, DSL to the definition. Um, what about ISP, right? So say you have a bundled purchase of internet access with other services, how is that taxed? It comes down to whether you can separately parse it out, whether you can separate those charges. There was also recently a Washington administrative ruling that got to the fact of whether uh, a, an email management service constitutes internet access. Because as we talked about, the definition explicitly includes electronic mail. But what about a more sophisticated uh, electronic mailing system? Does that qualify? And what Washington ultimately concluded was that that wasn't the intent of uh, Congress when they initially adopted ITFA. They were thinking of more of a normal usage of email, the everyday person, not some sophisticated management notification service. Um, so I, I wanted to make you sort of aware of that definition of internet access. 
and how it can be nuanced in different, cir in different circumstances. But throughout the context of this webinar, we're not gonna get too much into the internet access. The focus is instead gonna be on discriminatory taxes and multiple taxes. So the idea behind multiple taxes is that there's a ban on multiple taxes um, in multiple states imposing a tax on electronic commerce unless there's a credit provided by the other state. So if both Illinois and California are going to impose a tax on electronic commerce, there has to be a credit mechanism in place um, to, to allow them to not have the multiple taxation occurring. However, that doesn't mean that a state, a county, a city, they could all impose a tax. So, that, so the state of Illinois, Chicago, Cook County could all impose a tax. Discriminatory taxes is defined within ITFA as any tax imposed on electronic commerce that's not imposed on transactions involving similar property goods or services accomplished through other means. Meaning if you have a tax on electronic commerce, but uh, similar property or goods that are transferred or accomplished through normal traditional means are not taxed, that could potentially be discriminatory. Um, the other way is rates. So if you have uh, a tax rate on electronic commerce, but a lower rate on something that's uh, accomplished through other means, that could potentially be discriminatory. Um, there is, there is a, a five year lower rate um, phase out that you can have for it to not be discriminatory, but uh, that rate differential could cause issues. Um, the, other, the other way it could be discriminatory is if a different person is required to collect it. And this is gonna be discussed more in the context of um, Wayfair or marketplace facilitators later on in our discussion. So with that context in mind, uh, we're gonna delve into the case law, um, provide you some recent decisions. Uh, there is one big victory that uh, many may be familiar with in performance marketing that is, is commonly used as a, a weapon or a, a source of good case law for taxpayers and these other, um, these other matters. So Dave, without further ado, do you wanna walk us through performance marketing? Yep, and, and before we get into performance marketing, um, a few things. First, from a historical standpoint, and, and Sam, you don't have the benefit of this because you were in middle school back in the late 90s? Uh, I was using AOL. Yeah. <laughs> um, at the time ITFA was adopted, the real focus was on the prohibition on tax on internet access and what that meant for states who were grandfathered and as Sam said, what internet access meant. Um, there was some confusion that the Internet Tax Freedom Act prohibited states, um, or it meant that you as a purchaser didn't have to pay tax when you bought something on the internet. That was obviously not the case at all. Um, but the part of the IFA uh, that prohibits multiple or discriminatory taxes, at least initially, was kind of overlooked. I mean, it was almost like an afterthought that the real focus was on prohibiting taxes on internet access. But as we're gonna see in cases like performance marketing and others, that's really where the action today is with ITFA, is with the multiple and discriminatory taxes. We had a question um, from the audience about what a multiple tax is and whether there's any jurisprudence or, or cases on multiple taxes. Um, so Sam, you addressed the, the definition of what a multiple tax is under ITFA. Uh, the short answer on cases is no. You know, the cases we're going to be talking about, the cases that are out there, are all on discriminatory taxes or taxes that are allegedly discriminatory under ITFA. Um, but I'm not aware of anything that address, addresses whether a tax is an impermissible multiple tax under, uh, under ITFA. So with that as a segue, yeah, let's talk about this performance marketing case from Illinois. It's, uh, it's the one case that we're aware of where a taxpayer won on ITFA grounds. And, and by way of background on this, um, most of you are, are probably familiar with the Amazon laws that many states adopted in response to the Supreme Court's decision in Quill and the physical presence rule that we used to have 
for sales tax nexus. What a lot of states, including Illinois, did was they adopted rules that said a remote seller, you know, the Amazons of the world, would have nexus in a state if it had an agreement with a local business whereby that local business would put the remote seller's website link on their website. And if you clicked through, if you went from the local business website to the remote seller's website by using the click through, and then you bought something from the remote seller, the local business would get a commission. And so this was a relatively common arrangement among Amazon and other remote sellers and what became known as their affiliates. And states latched onto this and said, well, in that situation, a company like Amazon must have nexus with the states where the local businesses are because those are their agents. And so as a result of having an agent, you have nexus, et cetera. And so many states led by New York adopted what became known as these Amazon or click-through nexus laws. So Illinois was one of them. Illinois adopted a click-through nexus law. But the reason we're talking about it is because the Illinois law was limited to internet transactions. So what Illinois said, like many states, is that if you use some type of internet transaction, to do this online or direct marketing or performance marketing, then you're going to create nexus in Illinois for the online or remote seller. However, if you use a different form of, of what is known as performance or direct marketing, so you don't have to do performance marketing or direct marketing on the internet. You don't have to use a website link to do it. You can use a newspaper, you can use television, you can use a magazine. So one example would be a seller that places an ad in the Chicago Tribune, and if somebody, and you would include a promotional code with that ad, and if somebody buys from the seller, from the retailer using that promotional code, then the Chicago Tribune gets a commission. And so the Tribune in that situation is arguably the agent for the retailer, for the seller. But Illinois wasn't saying that that creates nexus. It was only the internet affiliates that created nexus in this situation. So the Performance Marketing Association challenged this law and said, that's a violation of ITFA. That discriminates against the retailers that use online direct marketing, internet-based direct marketing, as opposed to those re retailers that use offline direct marketing, the companies that use the newspapers and the magazines and television and radio, et cetera. And, and so that was the premise and basis of their argument to the Illinois Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court bought it. They said, they said this is a problem. This is discrimination. You're treating those retailers that use the internet less favorably then you use retailers that use other forms of performance marketing. And the Supreme Court struck down the Illinois uh, Amazon law or click-through nexus law on it for grounds. Now, Illinois went back later and corrected what the Supreme Court believed to be their mistake and expanded the rule to apply to any form of performance marketing, not just internet-based performance marketing, but this, this decision really does underscore that when Congress said you can't discriminate against internet transactions, um, the Supreme Court said Congress meant what it said, and, and this to them was an example of discrimination. Now, one thing we're going to have to explore as we get into some of these other cases is how similar do the businesses have to be? Do they have to be exactly identical? Because an, an internet-based performance marketing arrangement is, is not the same necessarily as a newspaper-based performance marketing ad. But the Supreme Court thought it was close enough. And, and so that's something to think or to keep in mind as we move through these cases is how similar do the two um, arrangements, do the two agreements, do the two businesses have to be in order for there to be a violation of the discrimination rule under the, uh, under the IFA.
And that's a great point, Dave, because one of the criticisms of the decision is that any disparate treatment that was caused by the statute wasn't the fault of the taxing regime, but just because the two forms of advertising are substantively different. They're just not the same. Um, one of the other interesting parts about performance marketing was that they raised the Commerce Clause, didn't ultimately address it, instead ruled on IFA grounds, which left a lot of criticism as well because people wanted an answer to that Commerce Clause question that they just didn't get here. Mm -hmm. So we'll move into uh, uh, some other recent uh, decisions. Now, as Dave mentioned, that was, that was our win. So you're gonna hear a whole lot of losses because ultimately uh, taxpayers often raise this and sometimes we get a decision on it. Sometimes uh, they'll, they'll walk away from the argument um, either in the context of settlement or litigation. But uh, there was a decision recently in January out of the Washington Court of Appeals that we think is worth discussing. So it's this Gartner decision. Gartner is a global research and advisory firm um, that provides services to IT uh, related businesses. They, they help to make IT related business decisions. Um, they sell a license or a subscription to what's called a research library. Um, it allows you to access all of those um, information about the IT firms in order to aggregate, to review, um, and what ultimately the court was analyzing was whether those services should be taxed at the higher Washington business and occupation tax rate for retail BNO um, as opposed to the lower rate for service BNO. And the statute specifically includes digital automated services within the retail tax rate, which is defined as any service transferred electronically that uses one or more software applications. So the bottom line is whether uh, what, what they're providing here fits within that digital automated service or whether Washington also has a carve out for whether um, when it primarily involves human effort. So the, the taxpayer tried to argue that instead uh, what, they're, what they're doing here is primarily human effort and uh, shouldn't qualify under the retail rate. Um, ultimately, the, the court didn't buy into that and instead uh, ultimately ruled that it would qualify under the real retailing tax rate. Um, relying on performance marketing, though, what the taxpayer tried to argue here is that this different classification is discriminatory contact. They're singling out taxpayers who provide these services over the Internet. Um, they, so what they used to do was sell them and, and transfer the reports by CD or by mail. And so now what's happening is that customers go on to this electronic database. And so their argument is, well, previously when we sold it through uh, a traditional CD or mail, whenever that's how it was transferred, when it wasn't transferred electronically, the, the, the lower tax rate would apply. And now the higher tax rate is applying. That's in violation of IFTA. It's preempted by IFTA. Um, Again, the, where the court came down here is that to Dave's point about similar or same, they just decided that these are not similar enough products or similar enough services. When you have a really sophisticated research database that customers can go and see indexed results or see how they're differently categorized, that's not the same thing as just getting a report on a CD or by mail. So it's not preempted by IFA. I don't know if the court reaches the right decision here. And this is something we're going to explore throughout this because I do have qualms with um, them requiring these things to, to really be, they, they don't say the same, but that seems to be the result here. Because if Gartner is, is providing the same service, if what a customer is buying is, is ultimately the same. It's just being transferred electronically versus through normal means. Um, is, that really, is that really different? Um, what they're ultimately buying is serving the same purpose. And I think that should be the focus instead. And uh, as, as Sam knows, I'm a, I'm a glass half full guy. <laughs> and so I look at this and I say, yeah, Gartner lost. 
But hey, kudos to their to their attorneys for you know raising the argument because I think that's a big part of what we have to be thinking about now, is is at least thinking of itfa as a potential argument, as a potential defense, something to raise, something to argue in cases, and and even if you're not success, successful, and even if you decide it ultimately doesn't apply, it, it should at least be on the checklist of of things to think about. So the. The next case is a very recent case out of Chicago. And this is a case concerning the Chicago amusement tax. So many of you probably already know that if you are in Chicago and you go to a sporting event, you go to a movie, you see a play, you do anything that qualifies as an amusement, you're going to pay a 9% Chicago amusement tax. Um, about four or five years ago, five years ago, I guess at this point, Chicago announced that it would be applying this amusement tax to streaming services, to Netflix and Spotify, et cetera. And so not too long after that, a, uh, a Mr. LaBelle um, decided to sue Chicago and to argue that the amusement tax as applied to streaming services was illegal. And he raised a number of arguments, one of which was that the amusement tax, again, as applied to streaming services, violated the Internet Tax Freedom Act. And, and his argument was, was twofold. Um, he, he pointed out that there were some um, amusements in Chicago uh, that were either not taxed or taxed at a much lower rate. So for example, um, Chicago has an annual $150 tax on what they call automatic amusement machines or automatic amusement devices. Um, <laughs> back in the day, we would call those jukeboxes or pinball machines. And so there's an annual tax on those, far less than a 9% tax if you were to take into account receipts. Um, and then Chicago also has an exemption for live musical performances when there are less than 1,500 people in attendance. So Mr. LaBelle looked at this and said, hey, if you're not gonna tax jukeboxes, or at least if you're gonna have a very low tax on jukeboxes and a very low tax on pinball machines and no tax on small concerts, then how can you tax me when I play Xbox online or I stream music, especially if I were to stream a uh, live performance or a copy of a live performance? What's the difference? So, so he brought a lawsuit and ultimately lost at the appellate court. The appellate court said that there was no violation of the Internet Tax Freedom Act. And again, you know, following up on what Sam just said about the Gartner case, that the focus of the court's analysis in LaBelle was on, are, are these really comparable um, alternatives? You know, is, is playing pinball in a bar the same thing as streaming an Xbox Madden game? Or is going to a concert where there's 1,500 people the same thing as streaming, you know, the same songs on, on your phone? Then the court ultimately said no. And, and they went into things like, you know, with a pinball machine, um, that's under the control of the owner <laughs> as opposed to uh, as, as a, the owner of the establishment, the owner of the bar, the owner of the restaurant, as opposed to a phone, which is under the control of the consumer. And they talked about the exemption for smaller musical performances, and they said that was intended to promote the arts in Chicago. So, so they very much, the court very much saw it as an apples and oranges comparison. And, and I do think ultimately, ultimately with these discriminatory taxes, I think that's where, that's where you're ultimately, ultimately going to land. Now, what's interesting about LaBelle is, and we'll, we'll touch upon this in, in just a second, but, but the other main argument in LaBelle was that, and this has nothing to do, well, at least in LaBelle, it had nothing to do with ITFA, but LaBelle argued that, that, that the 
tax on, on streaming services was not fairly apportioned, right? That if Chicago taxes, that somebody else could tax it too. And, and it's interesting because that goes to this question of multiple taxes. And so that was the question we got from the audience about what does a multiple tax mean? And I think maybe you have some indication of that in these cases where there are sourcing issues. There's questions as to, okay, if Chicago can tax streaming services, can they really tax the entire bill? Because what if some other state or local jurisdiction tries to tax that same service because the person with a billing address in Chicago is now using their phone or tablet in Florida? What if Florida tries to tax that? So, so the sourcing issues that we see sometimes in these cases really could be interpreted maybe or, or presented as multiple tax arguments under ITFA. So, you know, just kind of a different way to, um, to look at this. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Dave. Um, what, what irks me, I think, about this decision is even within their decision, they use the word same. So it's not that similar good services transferred over the internet or transferred electronically versus um, through some other means. It's same. And, and that is not what ITFA provides within the language of the act. Um, you know, I think we could have an apples to apples comparison if you have something like uh, a live performance of a comedy show versus uh, a comedy show that's shown over Netflix, right? So I wouldn't saw Aziz Ansari at the Chicago theater. I would, if that Chicago theater accommodated fewer than 1,500 persons, well, then the Chicago amusement tax wouldn't apply. Um, there'd be an exemption there. Versus when I stream that same performance over Netflix, assuming it recorded and showed on Netflix, that same performance, I would pay the amusement tax there. And what the court uh, discusses, is, well, why is the price of the ticket different? You're paying a lot more to go see that performance uh, in a theater versus on your, your computer, but it's ultimately still the same. It's the same performance, uh, just seen in a different way. And uh, what, one of the other parts of their decision Dave was pointing at was um, the differences between a live performance and, and something that's streamed over the internet is the fact that when you go see a live performance, the court said that you frequent the bars and restaurants around it, you're getting this uh, cultural benefit from not only the performance itself, but also from the community. I mean, I think as we're all trapped inside of our houses, ordering food uh, from Grubhub or Caviar or whatever delivery service, uh, I, I'm not sure that's quite right anymore as we're still sort of being involved with our community, we're still, I'm streaming my program off of Netflix and utilizing those same areas of my community and being involved. So I'm not quite sure if that makes sense, but even if it does, is that the bar that IFA requires? Um, is that really part of it? I think that they're sort of inserting a higher burden in order for it to, to be preempted here. And Sam, I wanna make sure, did you actually say apples to apples comparison? <laughs> yeah, I wanted to set you up for the next case. That's a, that's a great segue. But before we get there, uh, we do need to do our poll. Oh, good point. All right. So this is, this is the part of the webinar where we need you to participate to make sure you get your CPE credit. All right, guys. So please submit your answer. Um, I Looking at our attendee list, I saw a whole lot of hey, people hey in Texas. Hey, so Sam. I'm wondering if they're going to be kind to my eagles. Oh, that's right. We're doing this one now. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. We, uh, we need to wait for the next one. Sorry about that. No, yeah, you caught me. All right. I'll give you a 20 more seconds here to get your answers though. All right, here are results. So who had the first, the worst first pick in the first round of the draft? Most people are going with the Patriots by Patriots. Tra <laughs> trading, a, trading away the future. People don't like that. They want to be in the now is what it seems like. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the Packers pick is also a little confusing just because they had to trade up to get Jordan Love and they're potentially not going to utilize him for a few years. But Yeah, and I was, I was born in New York, raised in Chicago, and I'm a huge Miami Dolphins fan. So to see the Patriots number one on this poll does not disappoint me. <laughs> anyway, moving on. All right. 
So uh, moving on to Apple, uh, which is what um, Dave was setting up. So yeah, we, we've set forth some of the prior decisions here. Now everything remaining is pending. So what's going to happen next? We're trying to predict where IFA uh, will be either be used as a, a resource uh, and it will triumph or whether the court won't pay attention to it and will rule on some other grounds. Um, so do you want to take us through Apple, Dave? Yeah, I'm going to do this quickly because we have 20 minutes left and I, I think some of the stuff that's coming up is maybe a little bit more important. Apple, Apple on some level is a, is a copycat of LaBelle. It's a challenge to the Chicago amusement tax and Apple has raised many of the same arguments as LaBelle, um, including an ITFA argument. Um, the, the difference potentially is that whereas in LaBelle, Mr. LaBelle was challenging all forms of streaming, whether it was music or games or television shows, what have you. In, in Apple, it's, it's just their music. And it's just Apple music, obviously, not Spotify, et cetera. So it, it maybe gives Apple the chance to develop a um, more focused record maybe a more robust record on just music that is, is provided by Apple Music. Um, whether it, it results in a different decision is hard to say. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, both of these cases, LaBelle and Apple, do involve sourcing questions. And that might be where the focus is in, in the Apple cases on these sourcing issues, these apportionment issues. But, but the ITFA argument is still in there. And, and it, it'll be interesting to see if Apple can spin this differently than LaBelle. Um, again, with a focus purely on just their music and maybe going back to some of the arguments that Sam was mentioning about whether it really does make sense to tax um, songs that are, are, are streamed as opposed to not taxing what is arguably the same music if you listen to it in person in a smaller audience. So. So with Apple, it's really a TBD. You know, it's still at the circuit court, the lower court, the trial court. Let's see what happens. But it's a uh, it's a good case to uh, to keep your eye on. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Dave. I mean, the difference between a, a live play and something that's streamed on Netflix, um, a, a movie is not a good comparison because when you see a movie in person, that's already subject to the amusement tax. Um, but some sort of play or a show program on a, a computer, it's not necessarily the same thing. But a song is sort of tit for tat. It's the same content. It's the same lyrics. It's the same performer. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll see if we get a different result here. Yep. And I, uh, I think uh, I, I, might have jumped, I might have jumped the gun, Sam, on that last poll question. <laughs> so I think we have another one. <laughs> We're good. So that leads us into our second polling question. This one's a little more serious. So the question is, what will be the result of the Apple litigation? Uh, will the Cook County Circuit Court render a decision for the department, citing to LaBelle, so pretty much just affirming what they already did at the higher level at the appellate court, uh, whether the Illinois Supreme Court will take the case, because uh, the Illinois Supreme Court decided back in March that they were not going to take LaBelle, so uh, will, for some reason, the Illinois Supreme Court take Apple, or will the party settle and we won't get uh, a decision on the merits? Um, the, it looks like most people are leaning towards the first, that the Cook County Circuit Court will render a decision for the department signing to LaBelle, so against the taxpayers. All right. Okay, this, this next one is a ruling out of Virginia, and as we've mentioned, you know, if you're if you're keeping score at home, we have one taxpayer win in the, the performance marketing case, we have a loss in LaBelle, and then we have a to be determined in, uh, in, in Apple. In this Virginia ruling, I would put this under the category of 
Um, if Sam Breslow were their attorney, we would have had a different result here. <laughs> Uh, because I think there was a missed opportunity in this ruling request. On, on, on some level, it's a very straightforward request. So this is the Virginia B poll, the, the local tax on business, professional, occupational licenses. And there's an exemption for newspapers and magazines and newsletters so that if you sell any of that stuff, newspapers, magazines, et cetera, you don't have to pay uh, the local Virginia B poll tax. So somebody wrote to the Virginia Department of Taxation and said, what if I have a blog? And, and presumably they charge some type of fee to access the blog. So they wanted to know, do I have to charge the Virginia B poll on access to my, to my blog? It was like a food and nutrition blog. And, and Virginia's answer was yes, you do. And that's because the exemption for newspapers, magazines, et cetera, has a very specific definition of what a magazine is or what a newspaper is. And according to the department, a blog just doesn't fall within the scope or the four corners of that definition. So as a matter of statutory interpretation, maybe the right result, probably the right result. Um, but then when you look at it through the lens of ITFA, and, and I don't believe ITFA was ever raised in this ruling request. But if you look at it through the lens of ITFA, I, I think there's a problem here because what Virginia is saying is that if, if you buy a food and nutrition magazine, you, or if you sell a food and nutrition magazine, you don't have to pay the Virginia B poll. But if you make that same content available online, through a blog, then you do pay the Virginia B poll, assuming that you run your blog from somewhere in Virginia. So, I mean, this to me just screams discrimination. Now, again, I don't think, I don't think in, in defense of the department, I don't think the ITFA was ever raised, but to me, it seems to be exhibit A of, of the types of situations where taxpayers should be thinking in it for terms. And in a situa situation like this saying, well, if you're providing an exemption for physical product, for your physical magazines, et cetera, then as long as the same content is available online, it for requires the same result. So again, something to think about um, and unfortunately never, uh, never argued in this case. Or really. Yeah, which leads us to, uh, I think, what a lot of people are probably most interested in, in right now, um, which is taxes on digital advertising services or advertisements. So there have been several states that have recently proposed legislation, Maryland uh, being the leader of the pack here. So they started off with uh, Senate Bill 2, and the language was uh, later incorporated into House Bill 732, which recently passed in the legislature uh, on March 18th. It's under review by the governor right now, who's expected to veto it, but then the legislature can override the, governor, the governor's veto with a, a three-fifths um, vote. So it, it's, that's probably gonna be the first one that gets evaluated. It's possible that Maryland could uh, amend the, the proposed language in the meantime. But we want to walk you through the three of these, um, compare them a little bit, but really focus primarily on Maryland. So what Maryland is seeking to impose is the tax on annual gross revenues. It's, a, it's akin to a gross receipts tax of a person derived from digital advertising services. Um, so what are digital advertising services? They define it as advertisement services on a digital interface. A digital interface, I, I suppose, could be many things. It could be a cell phone. It could be uh, the internet over a computer. Um, it could have a really wide range of meaning. Um, and they, they define that further as advertisements in the form of banner advertising, search engine advertising, interstitial advertising. I had to Google that one. That's what, it's an ad that pops up when you're, you're in between activities. So you're playing a game on your phone and an ad pops up after you lose the level. That's an interstitial ad and other comparable advertising services. Um, the issue here is that Maryland doesn't impose a complementary tax on traditional, traditional advertising services. 
Um, so we, we have a clear issue with ITFA, um, which practitioners throughout the country have sort of raised the alarm here. Um, I, you know, there's also sourcing issues, which I don't think we should get into in the interest of time. Uh, clearly what Maryland is trying to ta target here are large advertisers uh, because the thresholds here are huge. Um, it doesn't kick in until you hit 100 million in receipts. Um, but recently the Maryland Attorney General um, came out with a letter where they provided commentary on whether they thought this was potentially preempted by ITFA. Um, they also got into other, several other arguments with respect to the First Amendment, the Commerce Clause and Due Process Clause. Uh, but what they, what they ultimately determined is that it's not clearly unconstitutional, uh, which is sort of a cute way of, of beating around the bush as to whether this is preempted by ITFA. I think Dave's shaking his head because it, I mean, this one is, this is probably the easiest one I think for us to talk about. Uh, but I, I wanted to talk about one of their arguments, which I think is interesting and could really be applied to a lot of these cases. So their argument is that um, the court could find that the relevant transaction for purposes of ITFA could be the sale of advertising services, which need not be conducted over the internet. Meaning when we look to uh, the de definition of electronic commerce, it's a transaction conducted over the internet. So what they're suggesting here is that digital advertising could be purchased over the phone. You could call your advertising company. You could call them and do it that way. You could mail something in. You don't necessarily have to purchase it over the internet. But is that the focus? Is when, when, the, uh, when Congress defined electronic commerce as a transaction conducted over the internet, was their intent the way it was purchased? Or is it the transmission of the digital content that's really at play here. And, and I think that's really what they intended. So I'm not quite sure if that makes sense in this context. Um, I, I've also seen uh, on the internet the suggestion that, that billboards won't be subject to tax, but um, other forms of advertising will be. And that makes sense, except there are electronic billboards, right? So there are electronic billboards where uh, the content is transferred to the billboard through the internet. Um, and then you can also, it can also interface with the customer. It can pick up my IP address and know that I'm nearby the billboard and that I've viewed this and, and send that information back. So in that respect, the act doesn't specifically carve out billboards. And I, I, I think that if we have a one-to-one -one comparison like that, an electronic billboard versus your traditional uh, advertising billboard that doesn't use the internet, isn't transacted or conducted over the internet, then I think we have a really good one-to-one -one comparison here where this possibly is preempted by IDFA. Um, there, go ahead, Dave. No, no, please, Sam, go ahead. Okay, there are several ways to possibly fix the issue with Maryland's law. The easiest and clearest being just expand the, the tax on gross revenues to all advertising, not just digital advertising services. Um, you know, that could have other ramifications, but that would be the clearest. Uh, I think what's also interesting here is the fact that Maryland has a gross revenues tax versus the other two states seem to be going more in the direction of expanding the sales tax base. So uh, New York started off with something similar, a tax on gross revenues, but then eventually uh, this past week they uh, proposed Senate Bill 8166, which would instead expand the state's sales and use tax base uh, to, to include digital advertising services. Nebraska is, has started from the get-go as just expanding the sales tax base. So, um, you know, when Dave was talking about fair apportionment, it's certainly more of a concern in the context of a gross receipts tax than a sales tax. Um, so if, if a state is going to successfully pass legislation, it it might be more successful in the form of expanding the sales tax base as opposed to a tax on gross revenues. Yeah, and you know, Sam, the, the irony in all of this is Maryland wants to earmark the, the, the tax revenue generated by this. They want to earmark it for education and the kids, which is great, obviously great, great purpose. But the, the irony is that so many people think that these proposed laws are so blatantly illegal and such a blatant violation of 
not only ITFA, but the Constitution, that these taxes are going to get tied up in, in litigation for years. And, you know, the kids will never see the money because it's going to be, it's going to be tied up in court. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's just, there's any number of problems with these, with these proposed bills. Yeah. And I think it's worth mentioning how these sort of came about. It's, it's speculated that they came from Europe who had similar bills, but what's blatantly not in uh, Europe's set of laws is something like it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, there, there are other issues than just the Internet Tax Freedom Act at play here. Um, yeah, First, Amis First Amendment issues, Commerce Clause to Process Clause. This is going to get attacked on many fronts. Yep. All right, so we have a couple minutes left. Um, we'll make these last couple of slides quick. Uh, this next case is the Walmart case um, out of Louisiana, which many of you followed. Um, there's also an Amazon case in South Carolina. These are marketplace facilitator cases and whether or not a marketplace facilitator like an Amazon, like a Walmart and Etsy and eBay is required to collect tax on sales that they facilitate um, rather than making the underlying seller collect the tax. And Walmart ended up, ended up winning this case in Louisiana. We mention it um, because one of their arguments down below was based on IFA. And it was, it was a, a kind of a creative argument where Walmart said, well, we're basically a shopping mall, you know, that we serve the same role as a shopping mall does where we don't make the sales, we just facilitate them. We provide the structure, we provide the place where retailers can set up shop and sell their goods. And states don't make shopping malls collect tax. So why should Walmart have to collect tax when it's really essentially serving as an online shopping mall? And they raised that argument below, they did not win on that. Um, and then by the time the case got up to the Supreme Court, uh, Walmart had pretty much abandoned it. Um, I looked at the, uh, some of the briefs in the Amazon case out of South Carolina. It doesn't look like Amazon has raised it in South Carolina either. But we thought it was a creative argument, um, you know, sort of a thinking outside the box argument. Um, but it doesn't seem to have much uh, traction at, uh, at this point. Yeah, and, and I, I just to, to sort of point it out, that the issue was not when Walmart is making sales of its own products, but whenever a third party is selling over its platform, they're just a collector here, right? So no different than um, whether it be a shopping mall or a, uh, a, a flea market. Um, I, I think there, there are clearly distinctions though between a shopping mall and what Walmart's doing here where they have more control over the transaction itself. They are collecting. Um, so I, I agree. I think it's an, it's an interesting argument that didn't ultimately get decided upon, but there are, there are certainly concerns with those comparisons. Mm -hmm. um, so our last is local sourcing issues. We have, we have two minutes remaining. Do we have any questions, Dave? Because I, I guess I would rather make sure we we address any questions before I get into this last one? We, no questions, but we do have some administrative stuff to cover. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, I, I think if you'd like to talk about this, I wanted to kind of raise it in the context of Illinois' Leveling the Playing Field Act, which has a whole lot of issues as well, um, similar to what's going on with the digital advertising taxes. It, uh, if it does go effective, it'll go effective in January of next year. Um, but this is, could be an example of, we talked about a discriminatory tax could be where it's imposed on electronic commerce, but uh, not something that's uh, transferred in a different way, or we talked about um, where a different rate. Another example could be a different person is required to collect it. And this was raised in the context of an amicus brief to Wayfair where they talked about the high regulatory burdens associated with collection and the fact that um, it, it does change who has to collect it based on whether it's transferred over the internet or not. Um, but yeah, we're happy to discuss that in more depth or any questions regarding the leveling the playing field act as it, it does have a host of issues. Okay, um, great. Thank you, Sam. Let's, um, it is just about 1.30. So, so let's wrap up with some housekeeping stuff. Um, first, for those of you who would like copies of the slides, we can make them available. We can also make 
um, a recording of this webinar available um, in case you can't sleep at night, you know, whatever. Um, so we can make the recording and the slides available. Some of you asked um, on the chat about the polling questions and apparently um, some people weren't getting the polling questions. So we apologize for that. Don't worry about the CPE. We'll make it available. If you were not able to do the polling questions, if you wanna let us know, we will keep track of your names. We'll make sure you get the CPE. Um, for those of you who would like more content on the Internet Tax Freedom Act, Sam is coming out with an article shortly. Uh, this is something I meant to ask Sam about before we jumped on here. Um, yeah. Sam, it where is it published? published? It will be published in state tax notes on May 11th. So for, for those of you who are, uh, have, do have access to state tax notes, um, but it will be available several weeks later if you're behind that paywall, and I'm happy to provide it to anyone who doesn't have access. Okay, great. Um, for those of you looking for more content that is not related to the Internet Tax Freedom Act, as we mentioned at the outset, this is the first installment of a series of webinars that the HMB Salt Group is putting on. So we'll be here uh, the next several weeks. Um, we have one on Jordan Goodman and Marilyn Wethicum are doing um, a multi-state update next week. And then we've got one on apportionment. Sam comes back closer to the end of May to do one on digital goods and services. So hopefully you can join us for those. Um, we really hope you enjoyed today's seminar or webinar. Um, please, if you have any follow-up questions, let us know. Um, if not, stay healthy and, uh, and be well. And thanks again for participating. Thank you for joining us.